Welcome to Northwest Pentecostal Assembly's Bible study for December the 9th. We're looking at the Gospel of John t um, today. I'm Jonathan Kienzler, and the text we'll be looking at is John chapter 15, verses 18 through 16, verse 4. In the last section, that is, where Jesus declares that he is the vine and we are the branches, we saw how Jesus' mission continues through his disciples. It continues through us. It's only possible as the disciples remain in Christ. He is our source of life. Without him, we can do nothing. And that's where we come to this section, which is um, about the opposition to the mission. We will face opposition. And with that word, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that Lord, you've, um, you've called us, you've chosen us, and you've brought us into your family. And even as you've, um, you say in John chapter 15, you are the, the vine and we are the branches. We can do nothing without you. We need you in our lives and we need you tonight. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, to our lives. Lord, encourage us, build us up, draw us close, empower us for the mission that you have. Give us words to say. Uh, and Lord, let us not be fearful of man, but let us let us live in the fear of the Lord. Let us live in awe and reverence of him. And, and Lord, know that you are with us and you will help us. In your name we pray. Amen. So Jesus now focuses on the, the disciples' mission in the midst of the opposition in the world. Um, in the world's rebellion against God, it has rejected Jesus. But because the disciples' mission continue his own mission, similar opposition against them is inevitable. <clears throat> so with that, let's read verses 18 of chapter 15 through 16, verse 4. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I spoke that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcast from the synagogue. But an hour is coming. For everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So the disciples' new nature that we've seen in the, in the past sections, remember that the Spirit is now who is with us and was with us is now in us. Remember that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We're in him and we have life in him. Well, it ensures that we do not belong to the world, but that he actually has chosen us to whom he, to whom he cho chose. He also empowered. He equipped us to be able to live in this world. But that's the reason why the world hates us, because we're not of the world. Opposition results because of our association with Jesus. And we see that in verses 20 and 21. Um, that remember the word I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So the opposition comes not because people do not recognize Christ in us, but precisely because they do. And it's important to, to realize that. They know that we're different, and they don't like that difference. They want to, they want to bring us back down. Um, they don't want anything to speak against the way that they're acting, the way that they're living. 
Well, we're going to look at three aspects of the opposition. Um, and first of all, we're going to look at the world opposes our exposure of their sin. So the first aspect of the opposition, um, or another way to say it, is the reason they oppose us is because we expose their sin. Now, John's gospel has, has highlighted the fact two times that Jesus is the light of the world. We saw that in John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So if we follow him, if anyone chooses to follow him, he won't walk in darkness any longer. He will have a life like Jesus. He will be characterized by light. And chapter 9, verse 5 says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Um, and so we see that while Jesus was in the world, he illuminated um, like those things that were around him. People who were walking in darkness could see that for the first time because the light has even come among them and shown, it, it showed them what was true and what was not and showed them that they need him. And also Jesus um, revealed this to, the, to them, to people, to the world and to us, that he's the light by his words and his works. And we saw we see this in chapter 15, verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. So Jesus comes and exposes their sin. Um, by his words, he shows his words are true and the words that they are believing are alive. And he also shows it by his works. In John 15, 24, it says, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. And so by the words, they heard the word. Um, we saw that and he spoke to them about what they needed to do in terms of repentance and turn to him and also by his works. He, there's nobody that is like Jesus. He brings blessing. He brings new life. He brings sight. Um, we see that he actually raises the dead. He multiplies food. There is nobody like him. We need him. We can't live on our own. He's the, we can accept, of course, in darkness, away from him, away from truth and away from life. And so through his works and his words, the, their shameful deeds of darkness are exposed. And actually, this was a it goes right along with John 3, 16, the reason why God sent his son into the world. Uh, when we look there, we see, you know, that um, God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, to not, to not in order to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Verse 19 says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. We don't, they don't want to be judgment, so they hide. They think that if they hide, they won't come under judgment. All that does is delay it, and all that does is actually keep them in darkness. God actually calls us into the light. If we will come willingly, if we will leave our sin behind, he will cleanse our hearts, he'll wash us, he'll make us new. Um, but we have, that's part of repentance. We have to turn from the dark sea that say that this is darkness and we need to come into the light. But those who choose not to are saying, as John 3.19 says, that they actually love the darkness, that they actually hate the light. And it's hard for us even to, to understand that, the idea that you could love darkness. It's Well, it's what you know. You're afraid of losing something good. You think that that's all there is. But now that's, it's one thing to believe that when there's no light. But when Jesus comes in, he shows us that he is the light and he shows us what darkness really is. He shows us what life is all about. And so that's Jesus when he's in the world. But now we're called to be the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, we see this. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to 
all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we're called to be the light. We can say, it says here, you know, we are the light. And Jesus would say the same thing in the Gospel of John. While he's in the world, he's the light. But when he goes away, his light is known and shown through us. Um, we declare his words. We do his works. We don't do, again, as we saw in the last chapter, we don't do anything on our, or in the last section in chapter 15, 1 to 17. We don't do anything in our own. We can do nothing without him, but through him, his, war, his life um, is, it, it is made known, and we can see his, his light. And so our words and our works will regularly contradict the lifestyle of those around us. Um, and we need to understand that on one hand, they're not going to like it. But on the other hand, they're going to know that we are his disciples. John 13 verse 34 to 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So the love, he says, the way we're to love one another is his very love. It's not just however we want to talk about love, whether it's just simply affection or liking something. No, it's the way that he loved us. And of course, he laid down his life for us. He thought of us first. He sac denied his own will even for us, as in he didn't want to die on the cross, but for us, he died for us. And so for verse 35, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And remember, it's not just any kind of love. It's the love that he gives us. It's love that's like Jesus' own. And so... Uh, our lifestyle is going to be different because we love one another. We're motivated. We act it in love toward one another. That's kind of the rule even of, not kind of, it's the rule of what it means to be a Christian is that we act and are motivated by love. One of the purposes of 1 Corinthians, for example, is to show the Corinthians that they're to look to love each other, to edify one another, to build each other up, not just to be selfishly looking at at, the moment, at their own selves and thinking about themselves, but thinking of others. But our lifestyle is different. 1 Peter 4, verse 3 to 5 contrasts this, the way we used to be outside of Christ and then the way that we are in Christ. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. And then he get, lists what that looked like. Having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. So what's their response? They are surprised. They don't like that you don't follow and go with them anymore. And what do they do? They malign you but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So as Christians, we know that we're going to stand before God. God has appointed Jesus as the judge of the living and the dead. We know that not only do we will we stand, we stand before him now. He is the judge. He's asking us now to bring our sins and everything before him, and he'll and he'll forgive us of all those things and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But we know that we'll stand before God, but we also know that all people will stand before God. They'll all give him an account. So the question is, whom do we fear? We know, they, uh, we know the world lives without fear of God, but our lives should testify to his power, his love, his holiness at work in us. So the mission that we have is something we will do because it's, it's out of respect and awe and of what God has done for us, he will do for others. It's out of love for other people that we don't want them to be lost. We don't want anyone to, to be lost, just like God does. He wants all to come to salvation. And so we act in love toward other people. We act in, in knowing God, but the world, we need to remember, doesn't. They don't know him. So that's the first point is that the world opposes our exposure of their sin. They don't want that. They don't want to be exposed. At least that's how they feel. They don't know yet life. They haven't seen it. So we're doing very much doing them a service, even though they may not like it. They might be offended in a sense at what we say that, hey, you're walking in sin. They might, don't call me a sinner. Don't judge, the Bible says. Well, we're called to, to 
tell people the truth. We're called to declare it to them. We're called to be watchmen even, that we would tell people that, hey, there's a day of judgment coming. We're called to, to be preachers of the gospel. There's good news. God loves you, and he's made a way for you to be with him forever. So that's the first point, the first aspect of, of the opposition um, is that the world is op that op opposes specifically our being the light, our exposure of their sin. Secondly, opposition to the disciples' mission will be severe. Okay, so we see in chapter 15, verse 20, for um, to start off here, and he says, Remember the word that I spoke to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And note also, um, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And note that the world doesn't keep Jesus' word. They didn't keep his word. They re rejected him. They rejected his word. Therefore, they will also reject our word. We should expect some rejection. We shouldn't expect everybody to accept what we have to say. It's, it's going to happen. There will be opposition. And then in chapter 16, verse 2, we see what else um, the opposition will look like. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. And so what are they? They, they are ostracizing us. They're like, I don't, we don't want you around. We don't want to be with you. You can't come in here. You can't tell us what to do. You can't preach the gospel. They will say all kinds of things like that. Now, we need to remember, we need to keep on. We need to continue to preach the gospel. Um, even if they don't want to hear it, we still need to because God, that's part of planting seeds, part of watering seeds. We're not just speaking our own words. We're speaking what God said. And remember the prophets, they were called to speak to Israel and they didn't want to hear. They still needed to, to speak it. They still needed to preach it. Why? Because some do respond. Because it's God's will, actually, that they would have an opportunity to respond and to repent. He gives them more than one opportunity. So they may have said, you know, we don't want to hear that. I don't like that. But you come again and you show them the gospel. You show them love. And their hearts can actually be softened over, over time. And so while their initial response might be negative, that doesn't mean that the end response will be negative. And then also... Um, we see that such, op such opposition will even get worse. In verse 2 of chapter 16, it says, An hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Um, in, in other words, opposition would even be considered, opposition to the church would even be considered respectable or even a religious duty. Persecution against Christians could be thought of as, as good and beneficial to, to others. Um, and that does happen. Those who, who don't like our views think that hurting us, persecuting us, um, silencing us is actually good. Um, whether they believe in God in terms of it's what God wants or they don't believe in God and it's good for the, for the community. And that's the idea like you can't preach Jesus. You can't talk about Jesus here. They think that this is actually a positive thing. Now, but we have examples in scripture of this happening. One of the best examples is of Paul. Um, he was of the Jewish ruling class even, um, and he had permission from the high priest to go and even um, throw Christians in prison and to even put them to death. And what, what, what happens? Well, Paul the persecutor becomes Paul the preacher, Paul the apostle, um, the evangelist. It's really an awesome thing. And we said, why is that? Because he was shown mercy, because that's, he becomes a, a demonstration and even an example of God's grace, how far it can go. There's nobody that can be outside of God's grace if they will but respond. And only God knows where that, where that is. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 13 to 16, we see this testimony of Paul. Um, he says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, it's hard to get worse than that, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And that really is how the world is. They're acting ignorantly. Remember, when Jesus is being crucified, he says to the Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are 
doing. And the grace of our Lord, verse 14, was more than abundant. You know, it was more than good enough gracious for what Paul needed. It's more than enough for anyone who would who would turn. And it says, with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. So we need to respond appropriately. That's the point there. So it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Really, it is awesome. And he is he has received God's grace. Jesus has made that work possible uh, in his life. So, you know, we also see in terms of the opposition that the world hates us. Verses 18 and 19 of chapter 15, we see this. If the world hates you, you knew, know that it hated me. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, because I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates us. Um, why do they do this? Why do they hate us so much? Um, why does the world hate Christians? Well, verse 21 helps us on, on this. But, but all these things they will do to you for my namesake, because they do not know the one who sent me. They don't know the Father. And in verse um and in verse 23, it says, he who hates me hates my father also. Chapter 16, verse 3 says, these things they do because they have not known the father or me. So we need to remember they don't know the father. They may claim to know God, but if they're hating us, they don't really know him. And even Christians who, who hate others, um, we see this also in 1 John that how can you uh, hate the, the, your brother whom you can see, but you say, you claim, you love God whom you can't see. He says, it's not, that's not possible. You actually, if you actually love God whom you can't see, you will be able to love those whom you can see. God makes it possible for us. So we, we see this. They do so because they have not known the Father of Jesus. Now, this is an opportunity for them to know. That's part of our witness. And what we're to tell them is that he, that he wants to know them and that he, how good he is. That's part of exalting and praising God in our own lives and to others. And to be a witness of, of him is that tell others how good he is, what he has done for you, that he's a God of love, of compassion, of mercy, of grace, even as Paul's own testimony is. He was in walking, even in darkness, walking as a murderer, and yet God saved him. And that's our testimony too. It's, but for the grace of God, where would we be? We don't have anything to boast of, our, of ourselves, only in what God has done for us. And what he's done for us, he wants to do for others. He doesn't have any favorites. He doesn't show partiality. His grace goes out to all. And so we also need to remember chapter 16, verse 1. These things I've spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. So Jesus tells us about the opposition ahead of time, how severe it is, that we would not be surprised by it. And I know there are Christians that are really surprised. Why is this happening to me? I want to follow Jesus. I want to do what he says. Why are all these bad things, this conflict happening to me? And Jesus says, I've told you about this beforehand so that you would not stumble. I told you this so you would be able to prepare yourself for it. Don't think it's strange, the difficult trial that you're, you're going through. It's because you believe in Jesus. The enemy doesn't like it. People who are in darkness don't like it. And remember that they did this very thing to Jesus. In John 15, 18, we see that. The way they treated Jesus, that's the way they're going to treat us. And so in John 15, 23, we see that they, they knew neither the Father nor Jesus, but actually they, they hate them. And so we need not be surprised. So those are the first two aspects of, of the opposition. Um, the first, of course, being that the world opposes our exposure of their sin. Secondly, the opposition to the disciples' mission will be severe. We should expect that, that there will be um, reactions, negative reactions to the gospel being preached because we do have an enemy, because he is at work in the world, because they people want to stay in darkness. They don't know anything better, anything different. 
and their their way of life even is threatened their pride is being threatened that maybe they were wrong and so even a call to the truth is is offensive to them they say no i've i've known the truth i'm the way that i'm walking is good but god comes along and says no it's not i want you to walk with me i want you to know me you're missing the great the, the greatest truth and the greatest purpose in life it's about knowing me and so that's where we come to our third point. Opposition to the disciples' mission is endurable. Um, we can do it. And just as Jesus endured to the end, one of a constant uh, message throughout the New Testament is that we're to endure. Uh, Hebrews, for example, one of my favorite verses, 12 verse 1, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance, or sometimes translated with perseverance, the race that is set before us. Um, the mission is, is endurable. We can do it. The race is winnable, you could say. We're to run this race in order to win, not as failures, not as victims. Uh, we're overcomers in this life. In the world, we will have tribulation. We'll have difficulty. We'll have opposition. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Now, I'm just skipping ahead. That's John 16, 33. But we, we need to understand we can, um, we can continue. And he gives us the main truth of how and why we're able to actually keep going, why we're able to endure. And that's in John chapter 15, verse 26 and 27. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. And so, the mission is endurable. The work of God is we're able to do it. We're able to carry out his calling in our life because he sends us the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. So our, our witness to Jesus in the world is not the primary one. And it's kind of an interesting one here. Um, the, the mission of witness is carried out first and foremost by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who does the work. He's the one who brings enablement. Uh, we don't get the credit for winning the world. He gets the credit for winning the world. He's the one who provides all that is needed, all the resources that we need. Only he can sustain us in the face of our of opposition. And he alone can work in the hearts of even persecutors like Saul, the, the, um, like Saul of, of Tarsus, of course, who becomes Paul the apostle and turn them to Christ. So Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. Now, in terms of um, what we've seen up to now, Jesus has already spoken of the Spirit bringing the very real presence of the Father and Son to them. We've seen that through the Spirit, Jesus doesn't leave us as orphans, but he comes to us. That Remember that the, the Father and the Spirit together come to us and make their abode in us, that we actually get to know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, in real communion, and real relationship now. Um, we see, we've also seen how he imparts power for service. Um, already now that we're able to do what we're able to to do the works that Jesus did and all of it because he sends us he gives us the spirit Jesus the spirit who um, is was with them and with the people of the Old Testament now in the New Testament now for all of the church the spirit is not only with us but is in us he indwells us how awesome that is now, Jesus is going to expand on the Spirit's role in the coming section, especially the Spirit's role in, the, um, in conviction of sin. We're going to see that in, in chapter 16. Uh, bringing people to repentance also is his, one of his main... How does that happen? How does a person go from darkness to light? How does he leave behind? How does he, at one moment, love wickedness and evil and actually then now love the truth how does he how is he an idolater and now is a worshiper of the one true god how does how does that happen well it's by the power of the holy spirit he does that work um the, and also he's going to teach us about jesus is going to continue to teach us about the spirit's guiding um work in our lives how he guides us into all truth so 
we remember even outside of the Gospel of John that Jesus sends the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He empowers us to be his witnesses. He gives us boldness, and we see that. They go out with boldness preaching the Word of God when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They become true worshipers of God, it, in other words, in spirit and in truth. Sent by the Son, as we see in verse um, 26, whom the, when the Helper comes, he's coming, whom I will send. So he's, he's um, this, Jesus sends the, the Spirit. And it says, from the Father. And I love, the, I love these verses. It's very similar to like Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. And so it can, the Holy Spirit can rightly be called coming to us from God and from the Son. But it's only through the Son. We only have the Spirit because of him and because we're in him. We cannot have the Spirit without the Son. And we only have the Spirit because we're in the Son. Uh, as long as we remain in him, we have the Spirit of God. And so he's sent by the Son and proceeds from the Father. Now, this reminds us of who is for us. It's really an awesome thing. Yes, we have the Spirit. Okay, the Spirit, again, I'm reminded, the Spirit brings the very real presence of the, of the Father and the Son. So we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in us. That's who, that's who is for us. That's who works um, within us. Um, and that's why this work is actually so endurable because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at work in us. So when the world is so contrary to the disciples and our, our mission, as it, we saw it was for Jesus, constantly even, they're looking to put Jesus to death, to stone him, to silence him. Um, they'll do the same thing to us. But when we see that, it's the Holy Spirit that makes all the difference. Remember before Jesus he began his ministry, he was baptized Remember in water, he became, he said, I'm, I'm entering into your experience even. And remember the, the Holy Spirit came and rested, remained upon Jesus. That's how he was able to endure. That's how he was able to do the works and how he was able to speak the words of, of God was through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus continues to do that now. His work he is actually, he continues to work and speak through the Holy Spirit in us now. Um, and it's really, it's the continuing work of Jesus of bringing salvation and life to the world. Um, the Spirit separates us off from, from the world. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit. It separates us off from, from deception, from lies. He's the Spirit of truth. And, you know, when you're in, when the world is is so filled with confusion, with so with darkness, and even the best you can get in the world is just shades of gray. It's it's off, it's very difficult to know what's right and wrong, in fact, nearly impossible in the world. The spirit of truth comes in. He helps us to discern right and wrong. He helps us to see, he's the light even that comes and helps us to see the truth, to know Jesus, to know what's right and wrong. And so he teaches us also the truth. And he testifies. It says, he will testify about me. I believe also in that testifying about me. It's testifying to us. It's testifying to us about what Jesus has done, what he has said, bringing to our minds what Jesus um, wants us to know. But it's also, how will we reach a hostile world? How will we bring life? How will they know Jesus through us? Well, because of the Holy Spirit, he will testify about me in verse 27, and you will testify also. Does that bring you fear? Well, you need to back up a, set, a second. It's the Spirit that testifies, even the Spirit that testifies through us. Without him, we can do nothing. So outside of Christ, it's fearful. Outside of Christ, the enemy is powerful is too powerful for us. But in Christ, we can do all things. In Christ, we're greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And so the hostile world, the opposition, all that they can throw at us, all that they can do to us, it doesn't sway us because we have the Spirit of God with us. And remember, he brings, the, he brings Jesus. He brings the Father even to us. And so we need to remember, too, that the Spirit is the primary witness. 
It's, it's, it's not all about us. Sometimes, we, I mean, really, we witness in our weakness. We witness in our perfection. Nobody knows the Word of God perfectly. Nobody knows exactly what to say all the time. But God works through us because the Spirit is in us. He takes our feeble efforts and makes them beautiful works of art, makes them speak of God's grace, God's um, doing, His work even. He makes sense of it. Long after we've, we've testified, we've gone, the Spirit is still working. And that's one of the awesome ways the Spirit works. Yes, He works through us. But you know, the, the Spirit, the witness goes before us. This is the promise of God in the Old Testament, that if we will walk in His ways, that is walk in Jesus even, okay? If we will walk in His ways, He will go before us. He will be around us. He will be our rear guard. And He'll prepare our way before us. And the Spirit does that. Do you know, before you ever talk to somebody about Christ, the Spirit has already been working on their hearts. Remember Genesis 1 verse 2, that the Spirit hovers over the waters, over the deep even. He, he is at work even among those who are living in darkness. God is everywhere. There's nobody that's outside of, of his knowledge and understanding and even ability to touch. And so sometimes we think, I don't know that that person wants to hear about Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit has been preparing the way. We need to have faith in that, that God has actually been speaking and preparing people's hearts. So he works through, he works through us. He works in people. He works through other people too. It's an awesome thing to know that we're not doing this mission alone. And Jesus often, in order to, to show this, he sent out the disciples two by two. He sent them out, first of all, by 70. And each of and, and those 70 divided up in groups of two. We're to understand we're not alone in the mission. We're not to be alone in talking to people about Jesus. We're to understand we have all that we need. He gives us a community that strengthens and edifies, encourages us. And you might say, I really missed it there. Well, someone else can come in there and, and speak then where we're weak, they can be strong. And also afterward, we can be feel like we really failed and they can tell us, no, God has been worked and, and used you. You have you don't see what I see, that God gave you boldness and strength and words to say. It's really, we're supposed to do this mission together. So he works through people. He works through events, even, in people's lives. Do you realize, what, you know, people, people die. People go to funerals and God speaks. People go to weddings and God is speaking to them about, about life. Um, he, God allows catastrophes to happen. We're going through a pandemic. God is speaking that, hey, you're alone, but I don't want you to be alone. You're afraid, but I don't want you to be afraid any longer. I, I want you to experience my comfort, my joy, my peace. That's what all, also in this section we find over and over again. And there, there are lies, but God wants us to experience his truth. God speaks in many varied and different ways. That's doesn't that give us confidence that, hey, God goes before us. God knows what people need. God's got other people to help water and, and plant seeds too in people's hearts. We're not doing this by ourselves. But the Spirit testifies too. The Spirit is working too. And so we see that even, one thing I didn't mention even, in people that don't know him can even have a dream. People that aren't saved can have a vision. We saw, we see that in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Peter, the preacher, gets a, a vision, but so does Cornelius. He gets a vision too. In the Old Testament, we see God giving Daniel dreams and, and so on, but he also gives King Nebuchadnezzar dreams. God gives signs to King Belshazzar, and it's Daniel who comes along and interprets and explains those things. And that's the way it is. God often tells people things and he brings us along at the right time so that we can explain, we can help them to understand what God is saying in his various ways. We can also help just come along at the right time. Remember, the Ethiopian eunuch is on his way back from Jerusalem to his, to his homeland and Philip just happens to be there right then and, and Philip is told to go up and talk to, to the person, talk to this guy and what's, he, what's the Ethiopian eunuch doing? He's reading Isaiah chapter 53. You see, God is at work. He's preparing his heart. It just so happens that God, when we go and we speak to someone that God has been preparing their heart the Spirit goes before us and speaks. Sometimes he speaks to them through the Word of God. And it's really, it's an awesome thing that the Word of God is 
is found in many places in our land. But you know, people are hungry to see, receive a word. It's like a famine even in, in our land. I believe we need more of the word of God. We need to speak the word of God. We need to speak the word of God whether we're um, whether we're quoting the scriptures. It should be so, we should be so full of the word of God that we're speaking it because the word of God is what's eternal. The word of God is what is transformative. The word of God is what actually brings new birth. And of course, the Spirit speaks through the Word of God. The Spirit inspired the Word of God as the author of the, the Word of God. So we can be confident knowing the, the Spirit testifies, speaks through us, but it's only one of the ways. But we want to make sure we're faithful. We want to make sure that we do our part, that when we stand before him, he'll say, "Good, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've, you've done well with even the little that I've given you. And not that I'm saying the Holy Spirit is little, but we need to understand it's a down payment of what we well have. How awesome is that? We're going to receive a more full, more fullness when it comes to the Spirit's presence in heaven. We're, right now, it's even said we're like, the, Jesus is even absent in some way from us, but then we'll see him face to face. It's really, it's an awesome thing. Well, I just wanted to wrap this up with just going over those three, the three aspects of the opposition that are against us. Once again, the world opposes our exposure of their sin. They love the darkness. It's all they know. We should actually feel compassion towards them, um, not hatred. They hate us, but we're filled with the love of God. We, when we're cursed, when we're uh, maligned, we bring a blessing. That's our response. We get to be a blessing to other people and even others, yeah, they don't deserve it, but neither did we. And that's how people are so often won. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's the first way the world opposes our exposure of this and they don't realize it yet, but, they, but God is at work in it. Secondly, the opposition to the disciples' mission will be severe. We need to remember, we shouldn't be surprised by this. They don't understand us. They don't know the Father or Jesus, but they can know. And that's one of the awesome things. You know, it could be very severe. You can go, why are they treating us like this? Because they don't know the love of God. Part of our job is actually to demonstrate, to show them, to witness it, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of their opposition. Thirdly, opposition to the disciples' mission is endurable, and it really is awesome. We can endure because we have the Holy Spirit. He's given us everything we need. He gives us strength. He gives us hope. Remember, Jesus gives us his peace. He, Jesus gives us his own personal joy. I love that. You know, when somebody does turn from darkness to light, there's no greater feeling in the world because the, their life is saved. Eternity is changed in that sense of for them, and there's a there's a new citizen even in heaven. A new member has been, ha has been added to the family of God. But the Holy Spirit is given to us. He brings all we need. He brings everything. And that's why in, I believe, in Luke chapter um, 11, verse 13, Jesus says, um, Luke 11, verse 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will the, your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And by the way, that's even asking him to those who are in prayer to him. And what are we praying for? We're praying that his name would be sanctified. His kingdom would come. People would go from darkness to light. They would go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. This, this verse, that we would get the Holy Spirit. That is what we need for all of our needs in our lives, that the Holy Spirit would come. And if we continue to pray that your will would be done, all that, that his will would be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. It's the Holy Spirit that makes that possible. That we would receive our daily bread. Give us our daily bread. The Holy Spirit does that, opens doors, makes provision for us. That we would receive forgiveness, forgiveness forgive us our debts. It comes through the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit, applying the blood of Jesus to our hearts. That we would not be led into temptation. We would know the, the devil's schemes, but we would have our eyes on Jesus and follow him all the way every day because of the Holy Spirit reminding us of what, G, of what Jesus has done, who he is, reminding us of his word. And that we would, um, and lastly, we would not be defeated by Satan, but we would be overcomers. 
Um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one by the power of the Holy Spirit. I tell you, that's all we need. All the opposition that's against us can't defeat Jesus, can't defeat the Holy Spirit, has no chance even. Remember, all the armies of, of the world, even including Satan, coming against God and against his people, how is God going to deal with that? Jesus is going to destroy them all with the breath, with even one word from his mouth, with the Holy Spirit even. It's really an awesome thing. Whom we serve is far greater than, than that which is in the world. The one who is in us is greater than, than that which is in, in the world. And so we have all we know. We can have great confidence. It is important to know opposition is coming. Opposition is here. We will face opposition. But greater is he that's in us. God will do his work even in and through us. So don't be alarmed by opposition. Don't be scared of opposition. Jesus, remember, comes and says, peace, peace I give to you. And he gives us the Holy Spirit, all that we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to apply this truth in our, in our lives, in our, in personally, um, and Lord, to make changes, Lord, in, in our hearts, that Lord, we would believe that you want us to speak your word, that you would put words in our mouth, that you would put people on our heart, that Lord, we would want to pray for them. And, and even when they malign us, even when they show hatred toward us, we would show love by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would testify to the goodness, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you empower us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you testify and you testify through us. We thank you that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth. In your name we pray. Amen.